You know, one of the things that has greatly encouraged me in so far as Scripture is concerned during this pandemic crisis is the passage that I find in Matthew 16, verses 13, all the way to verse 18. And it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, when Jesus spoke this particular passage, he spoke it in Caesarea Philippi, not in Jerusalem, which happened to be the religious capital of Israel at that time. But he spoke these words in Caesarea Philippi, which happened to be the center of pagan worship. People were still worshiping other gods in that area, gods like the god Pan and the god Baal. Now, the Lord Jesus chose that spot not only because he had rejected Jerusalem as the religious capital, but likewise, he went into that place to bring home a very strong and very important point. Because again, that place was supposed to be the headquarters of these false gods, the headquarters of demons who were behind these gods. And Jesus makes this very powerful statement, and he says, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Why? Because the church is founded on Christ. And not only that, Jesus said, I will build my church. This is something we have to remind ourselves. Sure, the pandemic crisis seems to have decimated our ranks. But you know, the work of God continues on victoriously. And we have some small wins and some big wins, small victories and big victories that God has given to us as a church. And we are thankful to God for that. And that is why we are not to be discouraged. But rather, we are to fix our eyes on our Lord and Savior, fix our gaze on Him because He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Paul, likewise, was very confident of the preserving and sustaining power of the Lord when he said that what the Lord has begun, what he has started, he will complete. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ will continue to fulfill his purposes regardless of the situation. And we are seeing that as well. Because after all, we know that our God is sovereign. And this gives us the impetus, or the impetus rather, to praise and worship the Lord. Let's rise from our seats and let's worship God. This is Lord, hallelujah, sing. Heaven and earth are filled with praise. All the redeemed shout amazing grace. Oh, what great salvation brings. Jesus is Lord, hallelujah, sing. Yeah. 
creation. We come in celebration. We rejoice in Christ the King. Jesus is Lord, hallelujah, sing. Heaven and earth are filled with praise. Oh, the redeemed shout amazing grace. Oh, what great salvation brings. Jesus is Lord, hallelujah, sing.
Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Our sermon can also be heard over DYFR FM 98.7 every Saturday and Sunday at 8 p.m. Good news, brothers and sisters, Enough is Enough is making a comeback in our church right now. And we are selling it again at 275 pesos here in our church. And you can get a copy right now and share it among your friends. International Bible Institute would like to make an announcement. We are now accepting enrollees for Old Testament 102, the early Israelite history. And we will be offering you an online pre-recorded teaching. For inquiries, you can contact us at this number, 0917-771-6297. Or, you can also visit our Facebook page, International Bible Institute, Cebu Extension. Enroll now! It's Christmas season again! Our book bundles are now available. You can purchase from any of these. We have bundles of two for only 500 pesos. We have two seasons of grief, two Enough is Enough books, one seasons of grief and one Enough is Enough, and finally, one More Than Enough and one Living in Christ bundle. If you would like to purchase our bundle of four, it is for only 1,000 pesos. And what you will get is one enough is enough, one more than enough, one living in Christ, and one seasons of grief. Grab your bundles now. We have great news. We are happy to announce that we now have our very own Living Word online bookstore. Your favorite Living Word discipleship materials are now available for download straight to your devices. For a very minimal fee of 100 pesos only, you can now avail of the electronic copies in PDF format. Our Ephesians Volume 1 and Volume 2 are ready for your download. The Journey series, Knowing Christ, is now available online as well. And likewise, we have free study materials like More Than Enough Study Guide, Enough is Enough Study Guide. To avail and for more details, please visit books.livingword.ph. Stay tuned as we make more of our discipleship materials available on our online bookstore. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001. 00006080. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234481. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. You may also send your love offerings and donations online 
through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless. The title of today's sermon is The Purging. We will take our text from Matthew 8 verses 18 to 22. Let's read together this passage. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. Then a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me, and allow the dead to bury their own dead. Let us bow our heads in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you, O God, for this blessed time you've given us, O God, to once again study your word. We pray, O Lord, that today you might minister to us in a very special way. We pray, O God, that you might draw us to yourself and draw us to a greater commitment as well as a greater surrender to you. We ask, O God, that the passage that we will be studying today would truly be meaningful and purposeful. And Lord, whatever is going to be achieved today, we will give you back the glory, the praises, and the thanks. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. Now, Jesus' ministry started with a bang. And why not? The Lord Jesus Christ spoke like no other person spoke. I mean, he spoke with so much authority and so much power. Every time he spoke, people were convicted with his message, and they were practically hanging at every word that Jesus would say. But aside from that, Jesus performed many stupendous miracles. Miracles that eye has never seen nor ear has heard. And therefore, there was a huge crowd that followed the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, a multitude followed him. Now, of course, when we talk about a very popular movement, as we are explaining here, it's always possible that you would gather around yourself some quote-unquote bad eggs. Now, this is something that Jesus did not want. Jesus wanted that those who would follow him would understand the cost of commitment. And Jesus did not want people who were there merely for the joy ride, but when the going gets tough, they would leave. You see, discipleship is not something that we can pick up and drop off just like that. It's a lifelong commitment. And this is something that Jesus wanted. And that is why in this particular passage, what we see is that he presses the issue of commitment. And I pray that as we study this particular passage, you and I might somehow be more committed and more surrendered and more consecrated unto the Lord. I'd like to share to you uh, a little outline here just to guide our thoughts as we proceed on with the sermon. The first part, we will talk about Jesus avoiding the crowd, and that is found in verse 18. And then in verses 19 to 22, we find him trimming the crowd. And in verses 19 to 20, he gives a call to commitment to the rash. And then in verses 21 to 22, he gives a call to urgency to the tentative. 
And so let's dive into our text and let's talk about avoiding the crowd in verse 18. Let's read together verse 18 at this time. It says, Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. Now, where was Jesus located at this particular time? He was actually located in the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. And now he gives an, a command, rather, to depart and go to the opposite side, which would be the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now, why do you think he was doing that? I believe that the Lord Jesus was doing that with an intention, with a purpose. And the crowds had actually began to uh, swell at that particular time. And so what Jesus wanted to do was to somehow press the issue of commitment. And so going to the other side was really part of the design of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the decision to go to the other side was not incidental, it was purposeful. Now, we have to ask ourselves this question. Are we willing to be more committed to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we willing to follow Jesus all the way? with no ifs and buts, with no conditions whatsoever. If the Lord calls us, would we be willing to give our whole life to Him? I believe those questions are relevant when we talk about this discipleship journey that you and I are in. Because discipleship primarily is about this love relationship that you and I have with the Lord. And in this love relationship, we have to understand that not only must the Lord be the one giving constantly to us, in return, in gratitude, we must be willing to be committed to Him as well. And that is why those questions are very important. Are you willing to follow Jesus wherever He leads you? How far will your commitment go? And I recall a brother, uh, one time he decided to pay his bills in the downtown area. Uh, this was his water bill. And so he noticed that after he had paid up his bill, that it started to rain like cats and dogs. I mean, it was really a hard downpour, but he had to leave. And so he decided that no problem with getting wet. And he was a brand new Christian. And so this did not bother him. And when he was crossing the flooded street of the downtown area, he was singing a Cebuano Christian song. And the song went some, something like this, Nagabaha ang kalipay ko. Nagabaha ang kalipay ko. It means my joy is overflowing. But then... Unfortunately, he fell into a manhole. And when he fell into that manhole, he said, Nalumus ang kalipay ko. His joy got drowned out. You see, my dear brethren, our discipleship journey is not going to be exciting all the time. It's not going to be riding on cloud nine all the time. Those, most definitely, we will go through some, some rough sailing in our lives. We will go through certain difficulties. And you know what? The Lord demands commitment from us. That is why we must be willing to pay the cost. And that's why here, what we will see in this particular passage is that Jesus presses hard the issue of commitment. Now, I recall when Napoleon would invade a country, what he would normally do is the ship that they rode on, he would burn it. He would literally burn it. 
And so from a top view uh, portion, he would ask his soldiers to look back. And when they look back, they will see their ship uh, burnt down uh, and smoke going up. And why did Napoleon do that? Well, Napoleon did that because he did not want his soldiers to continually think about going home and somehow allowing themselves to be vulnerable to their uh, opposition. And that is why he wanted commitment. Commitment unto death. That is what Napoleon wanted. And that is why Napoleon Bonaparte was a mighty conqueror. And of course, we're talking about conquest, not military conquest, but conquest in the kingdom. Remember that our battle, the war that we are waging, is against a very powerful invisible force. In fact, a very powerful invisible army. The Bible says that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, powers, and principalities in the heavenly places. And so we cannot afford to be weak soldiers. We cannot afford to be cowardly soldiers. We cannot afford to be soldiers without any commitment whatsoever. And this is the reason why Jesus wanted to make sure that people understood what it meant to follow him. So may I pose uh, this question to you as well. Do you understand what commitment to the Lord is all about? Do you know what following the Lord is all about? Because I believe we need to be able to ask those questions to ourselves. Because I find that there are many people who call themselves Christians, but when the going gets tough, well, they drift away from their commitment, they drift away from the Lord, they drift away from the teaching of Scripture. So again, what we are about to study is going to be very, very relevant in terms of our commitment and faithfulness in this discipleship journey. Now, we find in Mark chapter 4, verse 36, that indeed some of the crowd, when Jesus said that he was going to depart to the other side, some of the crowd went into boats and they followed the Lord Jesus. And that's what we see in another gospel, in the gospel of Mark. But then again, this was just the beginning of a series of tests. And that is why in our next uh, part right now, we're going to talk about how Jesus trimmed the crowd. And so we find this in verses 19 to 22. So first of all, we find a call to commitment to the rash in verses 19 to 20. And let's read verse 19 at this time. It goes, Then a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, again, I'd like you to pay attention to the details that Matthew gives to us. I mean, he doesn't just say that there was a man who said so and so, but he tells us specifically what kind of a person was speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ. In this particular case, Matthew takes note of the fact that the one who was speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ was a scribe. Now, allow me to give you a little description of who or what a scribe is. A scribe was an authority of Jewish law, and not only that, he was closely allied to the Pharisees. They were teachers of the law. They were considered part of the intellectual elite of Jewish society. They belonged to a scholarly class, and they were highly trained, highly educated. They were, in fact, fiercely loyal to their religious traditions. And so this was something that describes a scribe. And he says to the Lord Jesus Christ, I will follow you wherever you go. 
Now, when we really think about it, the decision of the scribe was too quick. It was too quick a response. And that's why I'd like to call the scribe a rash disciple. Maybe we can even say that he was very impulsive. He was an impulsive disciple. And if you recall, the Lord Jesus Christ actually spoke about the parable of the seeds, wherein there are those who are really excited to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But then again, when the going gets tough, they easily slide away from their commitment. And again, this was something that Jesus wanted to be careful about. Now, we have to say in fairness that this statement, if sincere, was something that would cause this scribe to break away from the scholarly, educated, influential class that he belonged to. And that would be a huge, a huge uh, giveaway that he would be giving to the Lord. Because, again, this would bring him into disrepute. Because in the first place, Jesus was not educated. Jesus was not trained like him. He was not trained in the classic uh, rabbinical schools of that time. And so it's much like a, a Harvard graduate, for example, listening to a carpenter. And obviously, that is something that uh, would bring him into disrepute, most especially considering the fact that Jesus was against many of the traditions of the Pharisees, as well as the scribes. So the big question that obviously Jesus wanted to be planted in the mind of this scribe is, are you willing to forego that? Are you willing to give that away? Your influence, your being known as a reputable scholar, being known as an intellectual, and you're going to follow me. You're going to listen to me. You're going to learn from me. Is that all right with you? And you have to know that I will be breaking or you will be breaking away from, from many of your own traditions. And so many of your friends, many of your colleagues will probably remove you from their own circle. And the question is, are you willing? Are you willing to give all of that up? You see, one of the things that we have to consider is the fact that, that when we commit ourselves to Jesus Christ, we don't just give a portion of our lives and say, Lord, there are certain things that I don't want you to touch in my life. Well, obviously, that is not something that can happen in so far as a genuine discipleship journey is concerned. Because if Jesus is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all in our lives. And so again, we have to ask ourselves the question, why did we follow Jesus Christ? Because as I mentioned to you right at the very beginning in the introduction, people were following Jesus because he was popular. People were following Jesus because of this mob psychology. People were following Jesus Christ because they could get something from him. Jesus was performing miracles. He was healing the sick. He was casting out demons. And all of these miracles obviously were, were awesome miracles. And, and somebody like this scribe who probably witnessed all of these things was probably in awe of the Lord Jesus. But then again, as I mentioned to you, this discipleship journey that God requires of us is not always going to be a smooth ride. In fact, it will demand so much of us. It will demand all of us. The entire fiber of our being should be involved in this commitment. And so, 
as we look at this particular passage, we find that Jesus was not easily impressed by words. And, and obviously, you know, when, when you listen to what this scribe was saying, I will follow you wherever you go. I mean, it's impressive. And I recall early on in my ministry, there were a lot of people who were saying, you know, I'm committed to the Lord no matter what happens. And initially, of course, I have seen their love and their commitment. But then again, as the years went by, gradually, that so-called pledge of commitment was gone. And that is why, friends, again, we have to be people who understand, who understand rather, that to commit ourselves to the Lord, we need to persevere in that commitment. That is something that needs to happen. And again, it's possible that this man was following Jesus Christ because he found his preaching um, something that was appealing. And again, he was taken in by the mob. And it's even possible that he had the motive of wanting fame because Jesus was now becoming very, very popular. So we have to ask ourselves the question, why am I following Jesus? Is it because I treat God like a vendor machine? Somebody I can put or push my prayer petitions to, and then out comes presto, the answered prayer. Am I following Jesus because I just need him? Or am I following Jesus because I have seen who Jesus really is? The infinite God, the eternal God, the invisible God, the God who is supreme, the God who is the creator of the universe, the God in whom I owe everything. You know, we have to ask ourselves those questions. And that is why Jesus wanted to press the issue of commitment. And in verse 20, this is what he says. Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Unlike some churches, Jesus was not eager to take in the celebrities or those who are influential people. I mean, that's the trend that we find in so many churches. One, somebody famous, somebody popular, somebody wealthy, somebody influential who, uh, who comes into the doors or the, the, the places where we worship. We, we immediately give that person so much importance. In fact, sometimes what happens is we're not even sure if the person is truly born again or a genuine follower of Christ. And yet, just to keep him in church, what some churches do is they actually give him a position or a function in church. And I think that's not right. Because, again, we have to make sure about this person's commitment. And that is why Jesus knew and understood the human heart. That is why the Lord will constantly test us. He will test our commitment. He will test whether we are fully and totally surrendered to Him. And when Jesus was making this statement, He was really testing the genuineness or the sincerity of this man's statement. I will follow you wherever you go. Now notice here that Jesus did not question the man's sincerity, but he made clear the demands of true discipleship. Notice what he says, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests. Now, what is Jesus trying to, to bring out in this particular statement? What he's really trying to say is that Jesus had fewer comforts than those of animals. Animals have places where they can return, they can rest, and they can recover. But then again, in so far as the Lord Jesus Christ was concerned, he did not have the comforts that even animals had. 
Jesus had no place of his own. He had no home. He had no property. He did not even have a tent, so to speak. And then he follows through with a statement by, by saying, and again, let's read that passage once again. He said, he said here, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, I'd like to point out a particular passage to you, which somehow uh, makes us realize the, the truth of this statement. I mean, the literal truth of this statement. Look at John chapter 7, verse 53, and all the way to chapter 8, verse 1. Notice what it says here. Everyone went to his home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, one of the things that we do as Bible teachers is we try to observe certain contrasts. And by the way, this is one Jewish way of imparting truth because by way of contrast, uh, it is already making a very strong statement. So what it is saying here is that the others went home but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, which means, obviously, that he slept under the stars. Jesus did not go to a five-star hotel. Jesus did not go to a rich man's house to, to rest. No, he went straight to the Mount of Olives. He slept under the stars. Now, when you go back to the previous verse that we talked about, when he says that the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, all right? And when we examine the Greek here, it is in the Greek present tense, which expresses a continuously and uninterrupted situation. So what that practically means is that this was something that was normal to Jesus, that he would basically have no place to, to stay, to rest, or to recover. I mean, wherever he is caught in terms of ministry, well, that's where he would sleep. And if he's in a mountain, I mean, that's where he would sleep. If he's in the desert, well, that's where he would sleep. Or when he finds a cave, that is where he would sleep. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ did not have a permanent address to go home to. And the amazing thing about this, well, we know that it, Jesus used the, the phrase Son of Man here. And it was used 80 times in one of the Gospels. And this was used in Daniel to refer to the King of Israel. Now think about this, dear brothers and sisters. We're talking about a homeless king. Have you ever heard a homeless king? Have you ever heard somebody who is ruler and sovereign and who does not have a palace? This son of man, this king was a homeless king. And that is why when Jesus asks us to do something, to be more committed, he models it for us. He shows us the way of walking the talk. Jesus was not somebody who was merely a smooth talker. He was not just somebody who had a, a glib tongue. Jesus was not just somebody who was eloquent when he speaks you know, Jesus was somebody who lived out whatever he taught, whatever he spoke. This was something that he lived out. And so when he was pressing the issue of commitment, he was saying, you will not go farther than I have gone. What I ask you to do, I myself have done and even more. In fact, let me ask you this question. 
How many of us have died on a cross? How many of us are willing to sacrifice our own lives for the sake of the world? Friends, a lot of us are not even willing to do that. In fact, oftentimes our religion is a religion of convenience and comfort. Our religion is a religion of selective obedience. I mean, we only pick the parts of Scripture that are easy to do and easy to follow. But when it comes to certain verses of Scripture that demand our obedience, that demand our commitment, that demand our surrender, we're not willing to do it. We're not willing to follow. Well, Jesus is showing the way of leadership here. As Jesus said, he who wants to be greatest of all must be servant of all. And what a great and mighty example Jesus is. A king who was homeless. And he was homeless because he wanted to go from place to place to preach the gospel. He had this sense of urgency. And he wanted those who would follow him to have the same commitment. You know what the problem is? The faith of some people are so shallow. It is four inches wide and one inch deep. You know, sometimes our commitment depends on the weather. And I do not mean to speak figuratively. I even mean literally. I've noticed, for example, in church, when... We still had our uh, full in-person gathering that when it would drizzle, we're not talking about a heavy downpour, but just a slight drizzle, I would always observe time and time again that our attendance would somehow drop off a little bit when there is a slight drizzle. Some believers are simply fair-weather Christians. They are there when everything is all right, when everything is fine. You know what? In this pandemic crisis, we are all being tested by God. We are being tested with our commitment. We are being tested as to whether we will persevere. We're being tested as to whether we will continue our faithfulness to the Lord. I would like to ask you that question. Are you continuing on in your faithfulness to the Lord? Are you willing to pay the cost? And again, this was something that Jesus wanted to press. Why? Because Jesus knew the human heart. The human heart basically is so sinful, it is so selfish, that it only loves when it is first of all loved. It only does certain things once it receives certain benefits. In other words, it's the mindset or the worldview of people. You scratch my, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Basically, sometimes that's how people are. Jesus knew the human heart. I'd just like to point out to you the Gospel of John, chapter 2, beginning at verse 23, all the way to verse 25. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them. Now watch what it says here. For he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. So again, here the Lord Jesus knows the human heart. He knows how selfish the human heart is, how prideful it is, how it merely commits itself to something that is convenient and comfortable. Something that would give him something. 
And the Lord Jesus wanted to make people realize there is a cost to commitment. There is self-denial. There is suffering. There is sacrifice. That is the cost of commitment. The nature of Jesus' ministry, by the way, caused him to keep on moving because of this sense of urgency. Because he wanted to visit all the cities and all the towns and all the villages to preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that the people needed to repent. Jesus needed to move fast because he knew that his time was short, three years to be exact. And he had a very important, in fact, the most important message to share to the Jewish people. And that is why he could not afford to really build a house for himself where he would go back and, you know, rest. He was constantly on the move. And those who would follow him had to make those sacrifices. They had to be willing to be like their homeless king. Now, let's talk about the call to urgency to the tentative as we find it in verses 21 to 22. In verse 21, it says, Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. Now, when you hear this or read this particular passage, I mean, it sounds so reasonable. And maybe the question that some of us would ask is, why would not the Lord Jesus allow this? I mean, if you're mourning the death of your father, shouldn't you be allowed to, at the very least, bury your own father? But you see, some of us fail to uh, miss out um, in the translation, so to speak, because what we don't understand is that this was actually a figurative expression, which was very common during that time. So allow me to give you a little background so that you would understand what this man was asking. Now, here's the background. His father was not yet dead. How do we know that? Because under Jewish law, a dead man must be buried within 24 hours. If his father was dead, he would have been in the funeral service. The phrase was actually a common Near Eastern figure of speech that referred to a son's responsibility to help his father in the family business until the father died and the inheritance was distributed. Obviously, such a commitment could involve a long period of time. 30 or 40 years or more if the father was relatively young. The expression is still used in parts of the Middle East today. A few years ago, there was a missionary who asked a rich young Turkish man to go with him on a trip to Europe, during which time the missionary hoped to disciple the man. When the young man replied that he must bury his father, the missionary offered his sympathy and expressed surprise that the father had died. The man explained, however, that his father was alive and healthy and that the expression, bury my father, simply meant staying at home and fulfilling his family responsibilities until his father died and he received his share of the inheritance. Since a man's inheritance was customarily lost or reduced if he did not fulfill his expected responsibilities to the family, the phrase, I must bury my father, is equivalent to saying, I want to wait until I receive my inheritance. So let me ask you this question. What was really, what was this disciple, this tentative disciple, really asking? Or what was he really after? Well, first of all, he was really after prosperity. He was after his own well-being because he wanted to wait until he got his inheritance. 
And so what he thought was that discipleship is something that I can pick up and drop off. No, friends. It's not something that you can pick up and drop off just like that. And sometimes that is what we see with so many believers. They're only Christians on Sunday. But from Monday to Saturday, they seem to forget that they are believers. They seem to forget that they are Christians. And that is rather unfortunate. Because the truth of the matter is we are believers in Christ 24-7. Every single day, we're supposed to be committed to the Lord. This man was too slow to commit. That is why I call him a tentative disciple. Lord, I will, but. Lord, I will, if. You know, this kind of a person sets certain conditions when he attempts or decides to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He makes conditions. But let me just tell you this. When you commit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, there are no ifs and buts. We have to follow Jesus no matter what. You know, as an illustration, if a country calls a young citizen to war, he is obligated to fulfill his duty as a soldier. He has to leave behind his family, he leave behind his parents, leave behind his home and fight for the country. And obviously that would put his life at great risk, but that is something that he is called upon to do so. And friends, let me just tell you this. God is calling us to a worthier cause. This is not simply fighting for territory or fighting for our country. This is really fighting against the forces of darkness because what is at stake here is the eternal destiny of people. That is why we have to be committed. You know, when, when this man said, permit me to bury my father, the word permit here is in the aorist imperative, which means that this man was practically demanding Jesus Christ to acquiesce to his demand. And again, we have no right to do that. We cannot have a sense of entitlement. We cannot, you know, demand from the Lord. He is the master. And we are the servants. We are the slaves. And therefore, we follow every beck and call of our master. And sad to say, many of us don't understand that. Again, the brand of Christianity that we find right now is a brand of Christianity that doesn't understand commitment doesn't understand consecration, doesn't understand dedication, doesn't understand self-denial, doesn't understand sacrifice. It's all about a Christianity of convenience and comfort. And a lot of people follow Christ because they think that Christ would give them prosperity. They follow Christ because Christ would sort out every problem they have. They follow Christ because they want healing. They follow Christ because they want a job, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not saying at all that Christ is not mindful of our own needs. I mean, just look at the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer tells us that the Lord indeed is concerned about our basic necessities. So it's not something that, that God doesn't care about or God thinks we're not supposed to, to seek. But you see, again, it's about seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness. Let God worry about all these things that He should be adding to our lives. What we worry about is seeking His kingdom first and His righteousness. We must live within the sphere of this life in Christ that he has given to us. And again, 
that requires so much from us. In fact, the Bible says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now notice what Jesus says in verse 22. It says, But Jesus said to him, Follow me, and allow the dead to bury their own dead. You know, follow me means that you need to deny yourself and take up your cross. Now, when Jesus would say, take up your cross, the cross is what? It is an instrument of death. And that is why when we follow Christ, there needs to be a dying to ourselves, a dying to our own aspirations, a dying to our own dreams, a dying to our own ambitions. And what should be first and foremost in our mind is the kingdom of God, the purpose of God, the ambition of God, the desire of God, the will of God. That should be the first and the foremost that we should really be concerned about. And again, friends, God will not fail us. God will not forsake us. God will not abandon us. God will not desert us. When we commit ourselves into the very hands of God, we have to remember that those hands are hands of compassion. Those hands are hands of love. So when we run to the Lord, He becomes our refuge. We are safe and we are secure. And as the Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. The master that we serve is not a cruel master. He is a good master. He is a generous master. But then again, friends, we need to understand that when we follow the king, he is the king and we are the subjects. Oftentimes, what happens is the reverse. We treat God as the servant and we treat ourselves as the one seated on the throne. We have to know our proper place. We have to know where you and I belong. Now, the Greek poet, he should, said, you can't plow a straight furrow when looking backward. In other words, our loyalty to God cannot be divided. Now, the word follow is a New Testament Greek present imperative, which commands ongoing action, a regular long-term way of doing something as an ongoing lifestyle. So following Jesus is not a one-time event. We're not, we're not supposed to follow Jesus because, you know, there's this wonderful event and I'm going to follow him in this event. No, it's a lifelong commitment. Are you prepared to do that? And again, we have to ask ourselves the question, when we surrender our lives to Christ, did we really surrender everything? When we made Jesus the Savior of our lives, did we also receive him as our own Lord? Did we surrender fully and totally our lives to him. Because friends, that oftentimes is the measure of whether the salvation that you and I claim to have is genuine or not. Because genuine believers will persevere. Genuine believers remain on in their commitment to the Lord. And again, we just have to ask ourselves that question. Are we that committed to the Lord? Now, Jesus said, allow the dead to bury their own dead. Now, what was Jesus talking about here? Well, the word dead here actually refers to those who are spiritually dead. Those who have no connection with God. Those who do not have any relationship with the Lord. 
They are the ones whose priority is the world. Their priority is their earthly existence. They are not mindful of God. They're not mindful of how to please God. They're not mindful of the will of God. They're spiritually dead. They are not connected with God at all. And because of that, they are the ones who are supposed to bury those who are dead. In other words, uh, again, using that ancient expression and what it meant at that time, what it meant here is, let those people who are committed to wealth and prosperity and their inheritance, well, let them be the ones to continually serve their, their fathers until they die and bury them. Let them go on with, with that. That's their choice. Their choice is they're not willing to be committed disciples. And if that's the case, then let them be. That is the point of what Jesus is saying here. Let the world take care of the things of the world. And that would be a paraphrase. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we like any of these two disciples? Are we a rash disciple? Somebody's impulsive? Somebody who just committed to the Lord because everybody's doing it after all? I hope not. Or are you a tentative disciple? Somebody who sets conditions in following the Lord. Somebody who has many ifs and buts. I hope not. Jesus demands nothing less than total commitment. Allow me to close with a story. And the story goes something like this. Why do people resist surrendering themselves to Christ? For many, the reason they give is that they don't really trust God to hand their lives to their suiting. A young lady stood talking to an evangelist on the subject of consecration or giving herself wholly to God. She said, I care not give myself wholly to the Lord for fear he will send me out to China as a missionary. The evangelist said, if some cold snowy morning, a little bird should come half frozen, pecking at your window, and you would let you take it in and feed it, thereby putting itself entirely in your power, what would you do? Would you grip it in your hand and crush it? Or would you give it shelter, warmth, food, and care? And with that question, a new light came into the girl's eyes. She said, oh, now I see. I can trust God. Two years later, she again met the evangelist and recalled to him the incident. She told of how he had or she had finally abandoned herself to God. And then her face lit up with a smile and said, and do you know where God is going to let me serve him? And there was a twinkle in her eye, and she said, in China. You know, friends, may it be that we are not like the rash and tentative disciple. May it be that we are the kind of disciple that God wants us to be. At this particular time, God is still purging the multitude. And I pray that you belong to that quote-unquote 7,000 remnant that the Lord was speaking about to Elijah. I pray that you have not bowed your knee to any other God, but only to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you once again for this day and this time. Thank you for once again instructing us. And Lord, we pray that you might examine our hearts, you might purify it, 
And Lord, if there is anything that we are withholding from you, may we surrender fully to you. We ask for your forgiveness for not understanding what it is to be committed to you. And so, Lord, we pray that you might change our hearts and strengthen us, inspire us. Thank you, Lord, for today. And thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to become stewards of your manifold grace, to partner with you and share our resources for the work of the kingdom. Lord, we give you back all the glory, praises, and thanks. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. So once again, brothers and sisters, it's been a blessed Sunday morning. I hope that the Word of God has been meaningful to you. And uh, my team, my wife Marie and my son AJ and Elaine would like to say hi and goodbye to all of you. But then again, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as our Facebook page. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so that you get updated with all our videos. And if you're looking for audio sermons, we have got a Spotify program as well. You can check it out. And by the way, if you want to find out all our locations all over the Philippines and in some parts of the world, kindly check out our website, www.livingword.com. And you will get to know more of who we are and what we represent. So God bless you all and stay tuned for some more reminders. God bless you. This pandemic crisis that you and I are in is not yet over. In fact, right now, a lot of people are becoming very, very worried because of the so-called Delta variant. And it's been quite sad that we are losing some people in our beloved Christian community. As of this time, here in Cebu, six pastors have passed away as a result of COVID-19. And it's not just those pastors who passed away because of COVID-19. There are many others. And right now, there are ambulances that are lining up in the hospitals. A lot of people have been waitlisted. A lot of people have been suffering during these difficult times. And the suffering seems to have no end. Some of us are suffering health-wise. Some of us are suffering economy-wise. Some of us are suffering emotionally. Some of us are suffering socially. So there are many, many reasons why we as a people are going through very difficult challenges. And all the while we thought that this is going to be soon over, but it is not yet over. So the question, of course, that we would like to answer or rather ask rather is where do I find hope? Where do I find consolation and solace for my soul? Well, I have good news for you, brothers and sisters. You and I know that the Bible inspires hope. The Bible inspires faith. The Bible inspires courage. And aside from that, we thank the Lord for literature that is quite helpful. And I'd like to announce to you that I have a brand new book which I wrote together with other authors and the title of this book is The Season of Grief. And this is all about stories that happened mostly during the time of the pandemic. People losing their homes, people losing their parents, people losing their jobs, people losing their children, and I would say that in the midst of all the crisis that all of the people went through, that I myself went through, I found hope in God. And this book, The Seasons of, of Grief, or The Season of Grief, will be able to provide that. You can buy a copy of this. 
in our church or in any of the OMF bookstores, this is only for 275 pesos. You can order this book. God bless you all. Hi, this is Pastor Mel Caparos of Living Word Christian Church. One of the things that I've really been very thankful of, most especially in the past uh, three or four years, is being part of OMF Lit as an author. OMF Lit is a mighty instrument that God has used to bless not only our own nation, but likewise other nations as well. Through OMF, the Word of God has gone forth in different parts of this world and in different parts of the Philippines. People have been edified, people have been encouraged, people have been inspired by the many books that OMF Lit has produced and likewise distributed. And I happen to be one of those people whom God has used through uh, OMF Lit to be a blessing to uh, many people, not only here in our country, but even abroad. And through OMF, I was able to write two books. One is this book, Enough is Enough, my very first book under OMF Lit. And this book talks about contentment. And this is a book I believe that a lot of people need to be able to read, read through. Why? Because many of us have many problems and some of us have not realized that the problems that we have have come about because of greed, because of envy, because of discontent. And somehow, this book will help you navigate through your spiritual life and your journey so that it can guide you, help you, instruct you on how to be content. You know, there's nothing like a contented life. There is just a stillness and a calmness that you and I will have when you and I are content. We rest in God. We rest in Him because we know He is all-wise and all-loving. A second book that OM, OMF Lit has distributed and produced, of course, for me is this book, More Than Enough. It talks about how to overcome our own trials. And you know, this 2020 and even this 2021 has been filled with so many trials. I mean, it's not just the pandemic crisis. There is unemployment. There's losing our own jobs. There's also the case of uh, uh, losing um, our social you know, life because of the, the thing that has caused us to, to distance ourselves with each other. And so it has resulted in not only death because of the pandemic crisis. There's some people who committed suicide. There's some people who have done things that they now regret. And again, we need to be able to overcome our trials. This book, More Than Enough, will help you navigate through the trials of life. So please do not forget, enough is enough and more than enough. Thank you, OMF. You are such a blessing to us.